Good evening, and welcome to the museum's Walter and Leonor Annenberg Theater. I'm Jan Newharth, the Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Tonight, as we near the one-year anniversary of the inauguration of President Donald Trump, we partner with the Committee to Protect Journalists to assess the state of press freedom in the United States. Last year, CPJ launched a new nonpartisan website dedicated to documenting press freedom abuses across the United States. Led by the Committee to Protect Journalists and Freedom of the Press Foundation, the site serves as a central repository of data at a time when journalists in the U.S. are facing increased hostility. The museum is proud to partner with CPJ as part of its Press Freedom Coalition on this important effort. And in just a moment, you'll meet and hear from Joel Simon, the executive director of CPJ who will provide us with results from the first year of the survey. The mission of the museum is to increase public understanding of the importance of a free press and the First Amendment. Since we opened this Pennsylvania Avenue location almost 10 years ago, more than 8 million visitors have experienced the story of news, the role of a free press in major events in history, and how the five freedoms of the First Amendment religion, speech, press, petition, and assembly apply to their lives. Each and every day, through our exhibits and programming, the museum informs our visitors about the valuable role journalists serve in our democracy. Walk through any of our exhibits, including the News Corporation News History Gallery, the Pulitzer Prize Photographs Gallery, the Time Warner World News Gallery, and the Journalist Memorial and you will explore the stories of journalists, both here and worldwide, who risk their personal freedoms and sometimes their lives to report the truth. Worldwide, attacks against journalists continue, and the museum will continue to relay their stories. But as CPJ's survey reveals, it's also a difficult time to be a journalist in the United States. Journalists have been arrested at protests and charged with felonies stopped and searched at the border, and in at least one case, assaulted by a congressional candidate. All at a time when their work is more important than ever. We look forward to tonight's conversation with journalists who on a daily basis are on the front lines covering the Trump administration. CNN Chief White House Correspondent Jim Acosta, Fox News Channel Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, April Ryan, White House Correspondent for American Urban Radio Networks and a CNN political analyst. And to provide some perspective from the heartland, Melinda Henneberger, an editorial writer and columnist for the Kansas City Star. Our moderator tonight is Jean Polisinski, the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Newseum Institute, the program partner of the Freedom Forum and the Newseum. We convene programs like this one tonight so that people of all beliefs can come together to discuss pressing issues related to our First Amendment freedoms. And we welcome and thank our museum members and friends of the First Amendment Society whose continuing support makes these programs possible. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Joel Simon, the Executive Director of the Committee to Protect Journalists.
Well, thank you, Jan, and thanks to the museum for hosting us today. Um, we're really delighted to be here. Um, just under a year ago, Donald Trump was sworn in as the 45th President of the United States. And the question we're here to answer tonight is, when it comes to press freedom, how are we doing? Let's go to the first slide there. It's right up there. So during his campaign, Trump, Trump excoriated the media. He lashed out at individual reporters. He mocked them. He taunted them. He promised that if elected, he would make it easier to sue the media for libel. He intimated that critical broadcasters might not get their licenses renewed. He suggested that he would go hard after leakers. So there are, there are serious questions about the president's authority to carry out some of these threats, but suffice it to say that as a press freedom organization, uh, we were worried. So we got together with about 30 other organizations to create th this new database and website, which Jan mentioned, and this it's called a tracker, and it's dedicated to documenting every press free serious press freedom incident uh, that occurs in the United States. And let's look at the data. So, a year into the Trump administration, what does this data show? And here's, here are some of the headlines. I'm going to read them to you. Journalists have been arrested 34 times in the United States in the last year. 29 of those arrests occurred at protests. Standing Rock, where protests erup erupted over the Dakota Access Pipeline, in St. Louis, where people took to the streets in response to a police sh shooting, and then right here in Washington, where there were sizable protests during Trump's inauguration. Nine of these journalists who were arrested were charged with felonies. At least one of these cases went to trial. Fifteen journalists have had their equipment seized. Fifty-four journalists have been physically attacked in the last year. Those, the attackers who carried out these, these attacks on the press, they span the political spectrum from white nationalists to anti-fascists. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Because we've only been tracking data from 2017, we don't know how this compares with previous years, but 34 journalists arrested, 44 journalists attacked in a single year, that struck us as sufficiently alarming that we did something that we've never done before. We carried out a press freedom mission to the United States, and we invited leading groups like IFEX, Reporters Without Borders, Article 19, the International Press Institute, Index on Censorship, to help assess the situation. And members of this unprecedented, pr unprecedented press freedom delegation are here with us this evening. So we split this delegation into a couple of groups. So some of the group visited St. Louis. And what they found there was that journalists covering the protests that had taken place were squeezed between aggressive police and angry protesters. And they, they told the delegation that with fewer resources and a governor who stonewalls the press, it's become harder to cover the political beat. No question, these are challenging times for journalists in the United States. No one likes being insulted or attacked. But let's face it, Trump has also been good for the media. Every time he tweets about the press, and he's done this 1,000 times, more than 1,000 times since announcing his campaign, viewers, readers, and subscriptions go up. Um, and Trump is obsessed with the media. So journalists have more visibility and more influence, and they're enjoying it. Then there's lots of access to the White House, some of it apparently unintentional. Um, there's also a blooming garden of leaks, and of course there's been some amazing reporting. When our international delegation visited Houston, we found there was a certain level of mistrust and hostility that was just become part of the landscape. But we also found that journalists were energized by the challenges they are facing, which has given new meaning to their work. One journalist we spoke with called this an inspiring moment Another said that 2017 was, quote, the best year since Watergate. <laughs> so um, let's get back. Uh, this, this, let me go, go, go to the next slide. So let's go back to the tracker here. Here's an interesting number from the tracker, and that number is one. And that's the total number of leak prosecutions launched since Trump's inauguration. Now keep in mind, in the Obama, the Obama administration launched an unprecedented war on leakers with eight prosecutions under the 1917 Espionage Act, more than all other previous administrations combined. And we haven't seen anything like that from Trump yet. 
the wave of lawsuits we expected to see at the beginning of the administration when we launched the tracker, they may still materialize. After all, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has said he is pursuing 27 leaks, leak investigations, and if they go forward, journalists who refuse to testify could very well end up in jail. But one thing is already abundantly clear. By consistently attacking journalists, by refusing to acknowledge the role of an independent press in ensuring accountability, President Trump is doing serious damage to the U.S. standing globally. And he's emboldened autocrats around the world. Or as Senator John McCain eloquently put it in a Washington Post op-ed published yesterday, Trump's attempts to undermine the free press make it more difficult to hold repressive governments accountable. There's lots of evidence of a Trump effect when it comes to global press freedom. Leaders from a dozen countries, including Russia, Turkey, Egypt, Myanmar, China, Cambodia, they've all embraced the term fake news and use it to delegitimize critical journalism that they don't like. Of the record 262 journalists in prison around the world, 21 are imprisoned for publishing false news, more than double the year before. So tonight, we don't know. The president may give out these fake awards for the most corrupt and dishonest media. We'll wait and see. But we've already gave out our awards. Um, we gave them out last week on schedule, I might add. <laughs> so we gave out awards in various categories. Here they are. Most thin-skinned. That was won by Erdogan. You don't see that up there, but Trump was actually runner-up in that. Most outrageous use of terror laws. Erdogan again. Tightest grip on media, China's Xi. Biggest backslider, Su Chi in Myanmar. And we gave Trump a special award for overall achievement in undermining global press freedom because we believe that his public disdain for the media and his failure to confront leaders who jail and abuse the press embolden their autocratic behavior. So where do we stand after a year? There's a surprising amount of violence and repressive action against journalists covering protests in the U.S., although we believe that it relates to a dynamic that preceded Trump, but it's out there. Legal threats may lie ahead, but they've not yet emerged. Trump's overheated rhetoric attacking the media has weakened global norms, eroded U.S. influence, and emboldened repressive leaders around the world. We have an amazing panel assembled to discuss these issues. And now I'd like to turn it over to the museum's own Jean Polosinski, who will join us and lead our discussion. Thank you so much. Good evening. Nice to be with you tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our panel for joining us for this discussion. Uh, we're uh, waiting to see if there's some awards being announced tonight or not. <laughs> I'm not. We may see news <laughs> happen as it, as it happens. Uh, truly breaking news, but well, we'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to start the conversation just for a moment or two, and then we'll go to questions. And I believe there are microphones in the aisles <clears throat> on each side. And, uh, you know who we are. If you could just give us an idea of who you are and if you represent a group or an organization or yourself, just let us know that. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, let me ask just a general question first to go to everybody. We, we've just heard from Joel about the threats to journalists rising, the number of threats, the nature of them from being tackled to charged to uh, shunted aside. And um, you work and you worked in a somewhat rarefied air of the White House press corps. And, and one of the questions that I would like to open with is the nature of whether you feel professionally that threat. I can recall as a young reporter going, covering uh, George Wallace's campaign, where uh, when we would go into these little theaters, the crowd would be fairly antagonistic. And then George, in his own way, would, would uh, at one point lean forward, and, and we waited for it, and he would do this, not these boys, and it was boys in those days. <laughs> Down here, it's their editors in New York, and the crowd would go. And by the time we left, 
people were patting us on the back, saying, you keep sending that copy into you know, your editors in New York and convince them that they ought to run what George says. But in terms of, of the work that you do and the opinion writing that you do, do you feel that sense of, of a threat that I think we're, we're hearing about now that provoked this extraordinary exercise by CPJ and others? Well, I, I think so. I, you know, I uh, covered the campaign as, as John did, and uh, April was out there some. Linda may have been out there as well. Uh, you know, I, as I like to remind people, because we forget these things, during the campaign, the now president, then candidate uh, Donald Trump referred to the press as, as liars, as scum, as thieves, as disgusting and dishonest. Uh, and he carried that, that act, that shtick, right into the White House and started to refer to us as uh, enemy of people and, and fake news. Um, that has had a, a corrosive effect. I think it's undermined people's confidence in the press. And, and what we've seen since then is that not only does the president do it, but he has uh, legions of followers who will repeat that and parrot that on social media. I absolutely receive uh, death threats. Some of my colleagues receive death threats at CNN. This is not news. Uh, this is something that's been reported on before. Um, and, you know, it's something that our, our folks are concerned about. But sure. you try not to take... Uh, too seriously, but it, it is an ongoing concern, sure. Yeah. Linda, your circumstance is a little different because you're not the Kansas City Star, but you've come to Washington and back and forth to the middle. Do you feel that, that palpable sense of uh, either attack or antagonism in, in what you're doing now? It's definitely different than, so I began my career in the middle of the country in Texas. And so all these years later, I'm back in the Midwest in Kansas City, and there's definitely a huge difference in the way people respond. When I was in Texas covering news at the very beginning of my career, and, and the pushback against the press is not new. I mean, that started at least back to Nixon. And so you'd get the occasional comment, but no one ever refused to talk to you. No one ever gave you a lecture instead of a quote. So you felt like maybe it was also because it's Texas. You interviewed you a higher class anything. of people than I did. I you think. could ask yeah. anything. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and now there is a lot of vitriol. There's a lot of anger. Okay. And so when I talk to people, they, they want to tell me, but they don't, they tell me they are not answering my questions, but they want to tell me what's, you know, how I'm a threat to America. John, the campaign and the, and the White House now? Well, first of all, let, let, me, let me state that I'm, I'm working with Fox News and have been working with Fox News for six years. Uh, for five years prior to that, I was at CNN. CNN. Jim and I worked together. And Jim and I also worked together at CBS, where I was for 14 years. So I've seen this from a number of different perspectives. I've, I've also been in a lot of different situations around the world, covering wars, uh, for example, experiencing the dangers and the animosity of the public. Some of the places I was, I was, I was covering the war in Yugoslavia from Serbia. And we were downtown Belgrade and yeah. traveling across the country. And you got no end of people being extraordinarily hostile to you. I remember being in Haiti in 1994, just prior to what was the aborted US invasion. And you know, driving down the street or walking down the street with a camera and having people go like that to you as you were walking by. So I've seen various levels of yeah. threats uh, around the world. Uh, that said, I would posit that this president is more antagonistic to the press uh, than any president, I think, including Nixon. I mean, Ron Ziegler famously yelled at the media, but I don't think that, and Nixon called them enemies at, at yeah. some point, but I don't think it was to this degree. Uh, so I think that Donald Trump has certainly taken it to a new level. And there were a couple of occasions in the campaign trail where I think he took it too far. One of them was at the uh, the the arena in Cincinnati, U.S. Bank Arena. Cincinnati, yeah. U.S. Bank Arena. I got there early because I had I'd come in early, but when the traveling press came in, uh, then candidate Donald Trump was just in full foment about the press, and the crowd, which probably numbered at least twelve thousand, turned on the press in ways that I haven't seen before, and that was the night that um, who was it that had to get escorted out by the. Was it there NBC? Was, was it? There was a number of us. Yeah, I yeah. Remember. It was some yeah, one, yeah, some yeah. one correspondent had to be escorted out by the Secret Service, but it looked like it was about to get dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So you can take these things too far, and you know, a free press is a hallmark of a robust and dynamic democracy. And anytime press is suppressed, we like to think it's in the very dark corners of the world. So I'd I'd, I'd like to believe that the United States remains one of the corners points of light 
in the world, but I think that sometimes the president does take it too far. Yeah. April, uh, you have been a lightning rod at one point for, for this point. confrontation. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm nervous sitting just, so close to her because yeah, yeah. if she gets hit. <laughs> Trust me, so you I, I probably take my just bullet. say. I know you right, let's start. Let's start over. Let, let's start over. Uh, April. <laughs> There's been a shift in the atmosphere. Um, yes, we've seen this before, but never at this level. Um, it's very real for some of us. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm the poster child on some networks now um, for asking questions. Some of the same questions I've been asking before. Um, it, for me, um, it's real. I've been getting death threats just for asking a question, a logical question. Um, I, you know, I'm making sure I am secure. The FBI is on speed dial, so is the Secret Service and the local police department. And it got real for me Friday in the, yes, in the Roosevelt Room. Uh, and you could hear it. I, you probably you were there with me. You, yeah, I was you, standing yeah, right you beside. Were standing you. right beside. So you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's have we ever had that happen before? I don't remember that. So that, I'm, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. But I, I want to. We were yeah. standing right next to each other, and I'm just. We're just now. I mean, I've heard it in different places, but not with an audience like that. In right, right. So we were, let me, let me set the let, let's set the scene. We were pool Friday. For the MLK. It means you represent everybody because you can't yeah, get we, everybody. Yeah, I was for radio, program. he was for television, okay. if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's a small, whenever there's a smaller space, there's a representative from each sure. group uh, to come in to that smaller space to report. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you heard this, but as I was walking up into the Roosevelt Room, I heard the cat calling of the press. Did you hear it? I heard a little bit of it, yeah. yeah. But it was the, your, your confrontation with Reverend no, but I'm, I'm getting ready to get in there. So so what, what was the audience? What was the audience here in the, the audience, or, the, or the group, I should the say? The audience were uh, black um, pastors. leaders, pastors, pastors for uh, MLK. leaders uh, in the GOP yeah. uh, in support of the proclamation that the president was signing. But as we were walking, I, I heard something different in the atmosphere. I've never heard it like that. This was just Friday, walking up the hallway, hearing. I think somebody said, "Here come the vultures." I heard something like that, and it was very loud. And I said, "Whoa!" And as soon as I walked in, it kind of got quiet. And then the president did his sign. He spoke. Uh, uh, ben Carson spoke, and then the, the nephew of Dr. King. Then the president moved over to the table to sign the proclamation. And then the group of people who were there crowded behind him, as the press will do, and we have the right to do under the First Amendment, this is our job, we call out and ask questions. At that moment, things had built up prior to, and I started asking questions. The president did not answer, and that was his prerogative, but it's also my prerogative to ask, and my right to ask as a journalist. I asked Mr. President, one of those questions, I said, Mr. President, are you gonna answer these serious questions? And then a pastor who was in the room screamed, no, as I'm trying to get the president's ear. You probably heard that, Jim. Yep. And I said, sir, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the president. I'm talking to you. Yes. So then, you know, I said, well, as a reporter, I'm like, okay. So when the president, I said, thank you for being the president while the president was in the room. I said, would you like to talk? He said, no, because I mean, if he was so vocal, do you have something to say? Do you want to speak out? And then, you know. He pointed a water bottle at you. Thank you. Recall. Yes, he did. Thank you. And you say, what do you mean by that? Thank you. I said, what is that? I said, what is that for? And he, and he gestured said, I'm the so bottle toward you again. Thank it you. Was, it was water bottle communication that I don't speak. So Thank you. But you <laughs> saw sure that. It was, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was and it, aggressive if you look, it was aggressive. And if you look at the camera, it looks like it's very far away. But he was close enough because I'm wondering, are you going to throw it? He said, no, I'm saluting you. I'm like, mm, OK. So with it being so tough in that room, I said, OK, and I, I wanted to leave to go to lunch, to meet someone for tea, rather. And he was there. I said, oh, boy, here we go. I said, because it was so hot there. We, we kind of can tell the temperature of a room or gauge a situation. Sure. And I said, i got to go meet this person. But I said, OK. So I said, all right, cell phone. Turned on video. He started taunting me. And they said, there's an expletive. I've got, I'll send you the video. 
There's an expletive. From a pastor. How about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and there was an expletive, and then he, words were exchanged, and he said, you were rude. I said, but this is the first, and I kept saying, this is about the First Amendment. And I said, when you come here, you understand this way. You don't tell me what to do, and it just kept, the crescendo of the moment was there. And I've never felt fearful like that. Yeah. Pers I mean, my, thank you for speaking truth to that situation. You were there, and I'm, I'm just thankful that you, because sometimes people don't speak, voice what they saw. I was doing my job, Where whether you happen? like yeah. the question or not. Whether you like the question or not, everything comes to the White House from war to peace and everything in between. This is the President of the United States. And when you have people, not just black, not just white, wondering about comments that you've been making over and over a pattern, I had a right to ask. And it's unfortunate, it's a sad day. But you have to ask a sitting U.S. President if he's a racist. Which people did repeatedly. It was uh, me it that was repeatedly over, asked. And, well, and, and there you go. Um, there, there may have been a few others, but uh, I wanted to ask you about a more recent incident. No, it wasn't for you, it was uh, me. The Roosevelt Room. There you go. Uh, but I'm going to, you know, I mean, I, I go back to the Grant administration, I think, but, uh, but, but you had more recent experiences than that. Um, this atmosphere that we're hearing about, that you're now at Kansas City, you do a column and, and opinion writing, mm -hmm. uh, but you've worked here as well. Um, you talked about it being more, maybe more sort of overtly hostile than mm -hmm. you recall in Kansas. Much more so. But um, what about this environment? I mean, with, with, when these people are doing what they do every day. I mean, I remember a time when the White House press corps was accused of being too chummy, mm -hmm. too nice. Right. You know, that it was too close a relationship. Oh, we still right. get that. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, some I folks fight don't. more than others, I, I think, John. Yeah. So. But, uh, I was going to say, I don't feel chummy. <laughs> at the, I feel like the chum. Oh, uh, there we go. I like that. Very good. Yeah. But, but what, what about this environment now? I mean, it, it, in terms of what you've seen, you know the work. Is, you know, how, what's your thought about how, how these folks can do what they do? Well, I think it, it is a lot. It's always been adversarial. And, and it's our role to be adversarial. So that's definitely not new. The, what I think is the big change is the public's lack of understanding of what our correct role is. So like I saw something on Fox News website about what happened with Jim. And they were describing him at, uh, so being kicked out basically of a photo op for doing his job for asking a question as April was just describing that sort of thing. So on Fox News, it said, you know, leading pr uh, Trump critic, Jim Acosta, who as part of CNN's uh, targeting of Trump. So there's this uh, narrative out there that is very much repeated back to me by people I talk to, by ordinary folks who watch television and read the newspaper that we really are the enemies of the people and that we're either critics, which we're not supposed to be, or we're um, fans, right? So I think, when did that happen, that, that we're cast as pro or con, when no matter, we're doing our jobs. I mean, now I do opinion, I did straight news for many years, and to me there was nothing easier than doing straight news because nobody ever got mad at me for opinions that weren't expressed. Yeah. But now there's suddenly this thing that you've got to keep quiet to be, that to be a patriot is to not ask questions. In other words, to not do our jobs. And there's a complete misunderstanding of why we do what we do, of who we work for, all these things that, you know, like people always said this, this crazy thing that would always, in the old days, make me laugh of, oh, you're just writing that to sell papers, as if we got some kind of commission you know, on that. <laughs> um, but now, there's really this idea that we're in it for self-enrichment, which again, is hilarious. I mean, anyone who goes into this business for self-enrichment, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can leave my pension out of this. But then, but, um, yeah, there's, there's just much less understanding than I think there used to be that 
we work for the public. We're, we're, to, we're not pushing an agenda, which is another thing I hear all the time. Our agenda is facts, and there's, there's, you know, that's the other frightening thing. You I can think. sense the Twitter sphere rising in anger over that last. Is uh, is part about that, facts. you know, we're facts are under assault. The the idea, not even anything in particular, the idea that there could be shared knowledge base and that we would come up with a story and if it were very well proven, the public would say, well, okay, I'm going to react to that. Yeah. And, and that has really been eroded in a very serious and dangerous way. Jim, you were uh, pointed out, I guess, so to speak, um, <clears throat> my new chum, uh, as it were. Uh, what, what happened there? You, you were you were asking a question, yeah, uh, and it was. Uh, I'm sorry, the, forgive me. The the person who was there, the the president of Kazakhstan, president of Kazakhstan, yeah, was there. Um, and as often happens, I, I saw a photo, uh, a lot of stick microphones. It's a photo op, yeah. basically, but it's become. It's what we do. The thing that you shout a question at some point. No. Yeah, I was in the Oval Office. What yeah. set it off differently this time? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if he's fixated on me or fixated on us. I was just doing the same thing that, that April uh, tries to do and John tries to do on a regular basis. I well, you do have it. history. Uh, there's, a, there's a little <laughs> bit of a history. I might suggest um, why he was fixated on you. That's maybe so. Um, I'm being a little facetious. Know, but yeah. uh, no, I, you know, we, we were going to the. And you're there as a pool. Also, you're There's representing a pool. I a represent, large, I was, yeah, we, were in the, representing, we were the TV pool that day. Right. We were CNN was the TV pool that day. And so I was going in as a representative of that news organization. And my job that day was to ask the president a question about uh, this S storm that he started last week when he said that there are uh, immigrants coming in from S hole countries. Uh, I don't know, this may be a family program, so I'll try to. Uh, it's the House of Free Speech. Polite. Fire away. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I thank you for your courtesy. Shit happens, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, now uh, you've gone too far. No. No. Children are watching. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I w <laughs> John's not going to be too long. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I went in there, and I, you know, uh, April asked the question on Friday, which I thought was a legitimate question, asking the president, are you a racist? That is a totally legitimate question, and there was nothing wrong with April asking that question, because when the president of the United States says it's you are a, you're coming from a shithole country if you come from Africa, and that we want more people coming in from Norway, God damn it, I will say it out loud, that it is our right, it is our duty, it is our role to ask the President of the United States if he's a racist. Now, that question had been asked on Friday, but my, my job on Monday was to ask him about the second part of what he had to say, which is, I would like to see more people coming in from countries like Norway. And so, so I asked the question, and he paused, and he said, I want people coming in from every, everywhere. White. Do you want more and then white? I said, well, what about white and Caucasian countries? And that was what set him off. Okay. And he said, out. Okay. Now, uh, let and, me, and I, yeah. you know, listen, to pick up on what Melinda said and what John said and, and what April said, and I, let me just get this out because yeah, sure. I want to get this out of my right. system. The only reason why we're here tonight, yeah. the only reason why we're having this subject, all due respect to Melinda, I'm going to differ with her somewhat, it is not just because the public does not have an understanding of what we do. It is not because the public uh, d lacks the, the intellect or the sophistication to understand oh, what no, the media no, is no, doing. No, I, no, I, I don't I, believe that for a second. I, I don't want Absolutely. You, and, I, and I don't think that's what you were saying, 100%. Um, I, my, my belief is, and it is a strong belief, is that the President of the United States is acting in a way that is simply unpresidential when it comes to dealing with members of the press. But we should not no, tolerate no. this. Okay. And I, I, no, no, I'm sorry. You, you, let, you me, know, let, well, let, okay, let me let me just say this: right. it, it is not right to call us the enemy of the people. Exactly. It is not right to call us fake exactly. news. It is not right to retweet images of the president exactly. tackling reporters, exactly. uh, Which, running them over with trains, this uh, is squashing not China, them this like is a not bug. Russia. This is the United States That's right. of America. And, 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 and I'm sorry, to, right. but but when I got thrown out of the Oval Office or, or told to get out of the Oval Office, I, to me that is a badge of honor, right. I, and it is something that I you know I had a colleague who said, I had a colleague who said, he sent me the transcript without. Underline in red ink, he said, frame it. And you know what? I am going to frame it. I am going right. to frame it. Now, but can I, me, can I piggyback off? Can I, can I ask? And I, and I, 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 I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not 
no, criticizing but, you but at all. But if I could yeah. answer yeah. that. We'll go here, then there. I think it, that the reason people have come to misunderstand our role from yes. previously having very well understood it is because of the supported. president, in part because of the president. That's right. And frankly, I also think Fox News plays a huge role in constantly telling people that, right. that we are the enemies and that we are behaving as adversaries instead of as watchdogs on the government. April, yeah. then John. I'm going to say this. This is, in, 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 even if it weren't me, I sat on the board of the White House Correspondents Association for three years, and I understand advocacy for the press. I understand support for the press, for, for this small elite group who is dealing with a lot in that it's this hurry up and wait thing. But in the midst of trying to get the facts, there's something that's gone terribly wrong here. And I'm going to go back to August when there was an ad that the president said, I approve this message, a campaign ad. He put targets. He approved of this. He and, and the campaign put targets on the heads of journalists and news anchors. And there was only one White House correspondent in that ad, 23 seconds in, me. I was the only White House correspondent. Everybody else asked questions. There are targets on our heads. There are people who literally take this in and think we are the enemy, like we, we've got some agenda against him. I have worked with four administrations, to include this one, I've had a decent relationship, a friendly adversarial relationship with each one. I am not the enemy. And when you start going down that road, you have to really look at it. It's, it's this smoke and mirrors thing. They want to say that we're the enemy, but the, the real issue is the truth is your enemy. And when you go against us, you suppress the information to the American public or to the world. That's the enemy that you hate. It's not us because we are the conveyors of the truth. That is the problem. But we get the targets. This is a really serious subject. Well, it gets back to John, what you were saying about. Let, the let, let me process, make a but, just. Let me make yeah. a, a completely neutral observation here, which will encompass kind of sort of all sides of the story as I see it. And I've covered a number of different campaigns, number of different presidents. This is a president who is, as I said earlier, more antagonistic toward the, the press than any president that I've seen in the past. But this is a president who also believes that the press is more antagonistic toward him right. than any president in the history of the United States. He is besieged every day by stories that are, you know, trying to find the worm in the apple in the Trump administration. Now, in every administration, there's plenty of worms to find, and so you do find a lot. At the same time, a number of very, very prominent stories have been incorrect, and he feels aggrieved by that. But then at the same time, here is a president who in his personal life made his bones and his fortune and his personal profile through the media. So this, this process has evolved over time, and to some degree, this is a much more extreme example of it. It's kind of like what happened with John McCain in the 2000 campaign. John McCain was the maverick. The press loved him, wrote fabulous stories about him. He ran for president. It turned 180 degrees. And John McCain came to hate the press as a result of that campaign. I think it's a similar dynamic here. It's just that it's exponentially larger than that was. You also have a president who, in more than any in my memory, inserts himself in as a newsmaker, not through spokespeople, Every not through day. cabinet members. Every we day just and sit there multiple and wait times for a day, right? I mean, a time multiple times Sometimes a day. Sometimes being a White House correspondent is the easiest job on the planet because you just wait for the this president to tell you something. Tweet away. <laughs> um, one last thing on your remarks. Yeah. I was listening to those, and I, and I, for whatever advocate, devil's advocate, whatever you want to call it, sure. you know there are people listening to you saying, that's that, that guy's agenda, that yeah. he's talking about what you need to do to uh, you know, go after the president rather than just recording or transmitting what he had to say. Yeah. You know, I, there are people out there who heard that and didn't hear democracy, they didn't hear free press, they heard agenda. Well, I, our agenda is to tell the truth and to give people the facts. And, you know, that, that, is, uh, that is our job, uh, no matter who the president is or, or what names he, he calls us. Uh, on day one, of the administration. Remember the first full day in office. Sean Spicer came into the White House briefing room <laughs> yes. and said this was the largest inauguration crowd in the history no, of the world. he screamed it. He didn't say he screamed. He screamed it. Yes. Full stop. Yeah. And then he didn't, like the Minister of Information, you know, Baghdad <laughs> Bob, 
He didn't take any questions and he bolted from the room. Yeah. And, you know, listen, and, and the we all turned, I think John was with me that day, we all looked at each other and we all were, what the hell just happened, you know? Yeah. And it has <laughs> been that way almost every day for the last nearly 365 days. And so I know that, and, 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 I, and I desperately uh, want the folks who live in those states that voted uh, wholeheartedly for Donald Trump uh, to hear this and to think deeply about this. And that is, you know, we are Americans. And, you know, we have a proud, rich tradition of rough and tumble politics. Amen to that. Absolutely. That's going to happen. That, that's been happening since, you know, Thomas Jefferson was accused of. Yeah. You know, and, and at least, at least nobody's slave beating children. anybody else with canes. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yes. Uh, but, um, but we've also, since the timing uh, of our founding fathers, had a rich, and profound respect for the news media, for the press, the First Amendment, the right to free speech, and the right to, to just tell the truth, to tell people what's happening on a daily basis. And so, you know, they, they, they have this, you know, visceral reaction to what we do on a, on a daily basis, but in part, it's because, and I've said this before, it's like the truth is on fire. And April and John and I, we go into the White House every day, and we're like firefighters putting out the fire because Day in and day out, we are being deceived by an administration that would much rather just all of us watch certain programs on, on John's network. And I, I don't go after John no. because I, John is a great I, journalist who's, uh, who I've worked with for I'm, many years. Yeah. But they, they, have, they, they have an agenda, which is to, is to turn people off of the press. And it mm -hmm. is a, it, 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 it's determined, it's purposeful, it is. and it is, it, it, it is bad for our democracy. Um, I'm going to go to questions. This, this it's, uh, could I just make one, one quick observation? Uh, it's so clearly not working, up. though, because ratings for CNN are People higher like than they've been in a long time. Yeah. Ratings for MSNBC uh, are higher than they've been in a long time. So if he's done anything, rather than turning people off the press, he's got more eyeballs watching the news than ever before. I think it is okay. working. And the thing that's it's also working for him. trouble, yes, and with his base, it's working, it's working for him. With his base, but the yeah. problem yeah. in the whole country is that that trickles down. So now, especially Republican administrations in, in states in the middle of the country think, you know, I can say anything I want to. I don't have to yeah. tell the Which truth. Which gets around back to the CPJ's question. report about the people being attacked. I don't have to, be, don't have to speak attacked. Eric Greitens, who's been uh, <laughs> governor of Missouri. You may have heard of him lately. But he hasn't spoken to the press. Maybe now we know why. But he has never felt that he had to speak to the press. Which and he speak, you know, he spoke to the Wall Street Journal, but he will not speak to local media uh, much Tech, at all. Technology too is making it well, easier to that's not speak to the press. Right where I'm going, yeah. and it's it's you know we've seen presidents before. I mean, Roosevelt went around what was then a conservative press, fireside chats. By fireside chats, uh, we have the fireside. No, I didn't cover now. Roosevelt. I don't know if you did. That's okay. No, uh, I I heard about him though. Uh, but uh, uh, but then Kennedy, people forget, jumped over the press that he thought was antagonistic to him. By, by having those briefings on television. Very telegenic guy. Mm -hmm. he, he used that new technology, relatively new of television, live. But this to is a total that. assault but, on the press. Well, and that's this is April, like, this is, I, I yeah. hear you. People yeah. but, always want to get their message but, out in different yeah. ways. But this is not just getting your message out straight to the American public and talking about confetti and, and talking about there's a wiretapping in my microwave and all that stuff. This is an assault, not only, this is, this is getting my message out like other countries do. You know, I want to craft my message. We are the free and independent press. Right. He wants to do something that is akin to another nation that does not value the press. There are a lot of mirror aspects of a lot of other countries. I mean, we used to, I remember with President Obama, it's like, oh, you, you're going on Facebook. We say, is this Russia? Yeah. You know. Now it's like, oh my gosh, there's no challenge. And people find it to be okay. It's not okay. And then when you have to pay taxpayer dollars, have to go for an investigation of what is it, what is it called? Uh, what was the vote thing? Fraud, vote, fraudulent voting or something? Yep. And then then voter registration fraud. Voter, yeah, yeah. Vote, <laughs> taxpayer wasted dollars. Then you also have to deal with finding out about the wiretap that, that wasn't there. I mean, that's why we're here to get to the bottom of a lot of this well, stuff. Well, the is, this founders is. had the antagonistic, they set it up from the beginning to, to be that check on government, that watchdog mm -hmm. on government, sometimes 
bark, sometimes bite. Uh, but we're going to go to a question here. I think we'll start over on this side. Hi, uh, Carl Golovin, uh, retired special agent, U.S. Customs Service, 9-11 uh, responder, domain reference, an idea lives on. Okay, Carl, I, uh, please get to a question. An idea yeah. lives on dot net. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Polisinski, thank you for being patient, though you've heard me ask questions before. No one else here has, so thank Go you ahead. for your patience. Uh, I've previously addressed a question to Jeff Zucker, John King, Wolf Blitzer, and uh, Jake Tapper, provided documentation to each of them from AE911truth.org that the official story of 9-11 is not true. My question for you, Please. Mr. Acosta, if the official story of 9-11 is not true, isn't that the biggest story there is? And if CNN will not report the biggest story there is, isn't everything else reporting just nonsense and fake news? Uh, I, How do you? Yeah. <sighs> Go ahead. Please. I, I would just say that I, I would just say that yeah. uh, that <clears throat> if you are uh, putting out uh, the story that uh, terrorists uh, did not hijack airplanes and fly them into the World Trade Center on 9/11. Oh, you sir, are, words in you my sir mouth. are you sir are bringing well, to part? us the biggest fake news of all. What's the fake okay? part? Well, Mr. Acosta, oh you're a liar. Right. Bye. 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 Give me, please, this needs to be right. civil. All right. Carl, don't know. You, okay. you got your question in. You got no. your question in okay. and no. your website. And so thank you very much. You don't Sean, have to get out. Okay. You are not Sarah. Uh, well, Carl please. asked a question Bye. in a lot, of, a lot of our programs, so we've gotten to know each other. Stay uh, as long as you let's, like. Let's go over here. And just because you see it in the brief room doesn't mean it's happening here. Ms. Ryan, I just tweeted this to you, but I'll ask it to the full panel. At a time when... Uh, press freedom, a constitutional freedom, is seen as a partisan issue, as a liberal issue. How do we change that? How do we talk to all sides about the universal benefit of a free, independent press? My name is Lisa Kaniff. I'm a freelance copywriter. Oh, Got to thank you. Them. That is question. the real that question. Is, there's the question. Core, that is the question. question. Yeah. I, wish I, I wish I knew the answer because it is not a liberal issue. It really is an issue for all of us. We're not trying to protect half of the people. I mean, and, and you also hear different criticisms, but I think there are also misunderstandings on the left about what we do and how, like for instance, recently when Donald Trump gave uh, a, an interview impromptu to the New York Times, like, you know, why didn't the reporter, you know, throw him over his shoulder and, you know, torture him while asking him, you know, uh, repeatedly, instead of listening to the president go on and on in a way that was highly instructive. So I, I wish I knew the answer to how we're going to convince people. But what I just try to do day after day, every single day, I try to tell people that what we do in a million ways, I say to them, is not partisan. You know, um, I have opinions and I express them in my writing because that's my job now. But my most deeply held opinion is that we really have to just stick to facts. You know, I just think at, the, at a time like this, when we're embroiled in who has rights and what are rights, I believe it's incumbent upon us as people to have these conversations. But I also think that it's incumbent upon these schoolhouses to start helping these children understand, seriously, what the Constitution is, and what is the First Amendment? Because well, so many people don't realize their rights. Yeah. What they have, some of us walk around with the Constitution in our pocket when we're here in this country and over in other countries just to know what's going on and to know our rights. I, I also think that the idea of press freedom is, is sort of seen through the, the prism of the polarization mm. of American society to a greater degree yeah. than it has been in the entire time I, I've lived here. Because, you know, we like to, I like to think that in the journalism that I do every day at the White House, I'm right down the middle. I, I watched you talk to a Canadian journalist. I was doing some prep for tonight, and you parsed very strongly the difference between the Fox editorial side or opinion side and the work that you... And, and there is a difference, and of it's course. the same as the difference in MSNBC's day side and primetime programming. It's just it's a different perspective. But the polarization of, of, of our nation right now on the extreme ends of both liberal and, and conservative is unlike I've ever seen before. But the, the idea of press freedom is seen through that prism. So if you're somebody on the far left, you want the reporter from the New York Times 
to put Donald Trump over his shoulder and, and carry him off to God knows where. And if he doesn't do that, you excoriate him, as, as happened with him. Uh, then if you're looking at this from the conservative perspective, and the correspondent from Fox asks the president a tough question, his Twitter suddenly blows up saying, why don't you go back to CNN? Yeah, so, I, I, think, I mean, yeah. I think to some of it, I, to some extent, and I, I, that was just a marvelous question, I think some of it is we have to hold a mirror up to what is happening in our society and what's happening at these rallies, what's happening among uh, some of the uh, Trump supporters uh, who, who just shows just sort of this hatred for the press. Uh, there's a book out uh, right where we were having drinks beforehand uh, that talked about you know press freedoms in this country and, and what journalists are going through. And it's a guy in a t-shirt that says, rope, tree, journalist, right. some assembly required. Yeah. I remember seeing that t-shirt at Trump on the trail, rallies right? yeah. during the campaign. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. We have to get through our minds that that is un-American. Yeah. We don't kill journalists in this country. The moment that that happens, the moment that there's a dead journalist on the side of the highway because of the rhetoric coming from this White House of the President of the United States is a day that we become something less than the United States of America. That is just that, full stop, yeah. end of story. And, and I think it's just gonna, t to me, I think it's gonna take an intervening event. It is going to take something that's gonna have to shake people's consciousness to sort of snap them out of this because people are, this, this toxin has been injected in the bloodstream. There are, some folks are under a spell where they think it's okay to go after us like this, and they're going to have to get it shocked out of their system. And, and I think that was, if, if I may, Joel, one of the reasons CPJ started the work here, because they saw that uh, happening in other countries, and there was a concern that that don't want it to happen here. defining moment yeah. could be occurring here. Please. Uh, Alex Howard, I'm the deputy director of a nonpartisan nonprofit here in D.C. called the Sunlight Foundation. And we feel pretty strongly that press freedom, transparency, accountability, ethics, and government are nonpartisan issues. But we're seeing that shift. And we're particularly concerned about one of the issues that was brought up um, around trust in the media. So the question is a two-parter. Um, first is, low trust existed before this presidency for a variety of reasons. Um, what are you personally doing at your networks to address that or at your paper? Um, or on radio, I should say, with uh, uh, you. And in particular, um, I have to ask you, Mr. Roberts, you've uh, serving as a journalist in an honorable way. I watch you on the briefings. You, you say you play down the middle. You ask tough questions. But your network is undoubtedly amplifying anti-press rhetoric and attempting to delegitimize the institutions themselves. That combined with a president and a party that seems unwilling to censure even a congressman-elect who assaulted a journalist and then lied about it. We are at a difficult place. And you said that I don't think there's been an impact. Well, the research I've seen from Pew, right, which is about as trusted a nonpartisan group as we've got, says that there has been an impact on Republican views of press and views regarding uh, censorship, regarding whether it's OK to assault a journalist, and views regarding change in libel laws, which the president talked about as well. Now, he talks about a lot of things and doesn't do them, like the award show that's gotten canceled. A couple other things. Canceled. Maybe, maybe. It's canceled. Hasn't canceled yet. Yeah, it's yeah. early. It's Is early. it canceled? Was it canceled? Yeah. All right, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But <laughs> I want to bring this back TV to these cliffhanger. two questions, yeah. because I, to me, they're the most serious that face us. Yeah. The delegitimization Your question. is yeah. an authoritarian question. tactic. Are you all going to call it out as such? Okay. And what are you going to do about trust in your network? And you, you're asking individually, what are they doing at their network? I think that would be useful if you're willing to pose the and question. Now, when, when I say that it hasn't had an effect, I'm not saying that it hasn't had an effect on certain individuals or certain segments of society. Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't affected news watching. People aren't turning off the news. They're turning it on to a greater degree than they ever have before. Rachel Maddow is now at the highest rated program on television. You've, at least more than tripled her ratings as a result of people interested in hearing her perspective, mostly on the Trump administration. So from that standpoint, what he has been trying to do to delegitimize the press has not worked. Certainly, there are people who are his staunch supporters who, I would say, have a greater mistrust of what people call the mainstream media than they have in the past. Okay. But what are, what are we doing in, in our, our newsroom and in, in our little, like, let me talk about my little world which is a four by six cubicle in the basement of the White House, right beside 
what used to be the bottom of the swimming pool. <laughs> Lovely place to work. We, we every day strive to get to the truth of, of what's happening, regardless of whether that, that truth reflects well on the president or poorly on the president. And our group of people, and there's myself and Kevin Cork and Blake Berman, who works for the Fox Business Channel, and usually a couple of producers, who every day try to find out what the truth is about what's happening. And that's what we're doing to try to practice good journalism. Mm -hmm. April, with that question, you know, I, I think there are people who you talked about getting death threats. There are people who would say that you are far removed from that effort to get the news, that uh, the critics, of, and I am not one of them, but the critics of you would say, you know, that you're out there like those liberal media types trying to make uh, a case against Donald Trump. How, how you know, within your work, uh, how, how, do you, how do you even begin to respond to something like that? You know how I, how, how I begin to respond? I am blessed every day for the last 21 years to be able to question four American presidents. And I have respect yes. for that highest office in the land, no matter who is president of the United States. And I tell people to this day, there are people, there are those never Trumpers, I'm like, he's still your president. And there's still a matter of respect. But at the same time, I am allowed to question him. My right as a journalist, I am asking him questions. I'm not sucker punching him. I make sure that when I go out there and I ask a question, and I know there's another onus of me, because the unfortunate piece is I'm a woman, and I happen to be black, if you didn't know. So, and people believe that a large portion, a large swath of America who are black, they just don't like the president. I, I want to interview the president. I have asked Sarah Huckabee. I've gone publicly on Twitter and asked the president of the United States, I would love to interview you. I would ask him the same questions I asked Sarah Huckabee. And I probably would put the question to him again to give him a chance to explain. I want to hear what the president has to say. I'm not trying to formulate, well, you did this and you did that, so therefore you are. No. Mm -hmm. I get a culmination of, of voices and hear what they say. I talk to people constantly inside and outside of the White House. And a lot of times that helps formulate the questions that I ask Sarah. People may think they're disrespectful, but I'm gonna say this. I have asked the same types of questions for the last 21 years of Democratic and the one Republican, well two now Republican presidents that I've, that I've worked with. Um, uh, we'll get to you in just a second. I want to sure. give these other folks a, a chance, and I apologize, but it's a very deep question, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, and I think uh, what April was doing uh, on Friday, what I was doing uh, yesterday, Friday. was just trying to ask the question. I mean, yeah. that's, that's it. You, know, I, you were asking about an agenda earlier. You don't want to know. Uh, the agenda is to ask questions and get at the yeah. truth. So, um, and, and sometimes, you know, they're a little tough with us. We've got to be a little bit tough back. You know, we have to... Uh, yeah. do our jobs. But to this gentleman's question right here, uh, I think every news organization is, is searching for those answers right now in terms of, you know, what do we do to say that, you know, what the president is saying about the press is not right. Um, I think one uh, area of improvement for all of us in the press, and it's just my observation, mine alone, uh, is that I would like to see the various news organizations uh, band together a little bit more uh, and, and show more of a united front and say, okay, when this guy is thrown out of the Oval Office, Everybody go. you know, we all go. Or the news organizations put out a statement that says, you know what, that, that's not, just not going to fly. Um, and, and same with calling us the enemy of the people and so on. I would love to have seen when that tweet came out on that day when he called us the enemy of the people, every news organization, every network, every newspaper across the country say, not acceptable. That would have been, and I think we're going to learn as we go, but I think moving forward, News organizations, we have to be a bit more of a united front in that area. The election seems so far away now, longer. Yeah. No, they're campaigning so right ago. now. They're uh, actually campaigning since, right yeah. now. But, you know, there was, there was more soul searching after this yeah. election, I, I think, among the press organizations in terms of avoiding, uh, of not knowing what was in the middle of the country or if you want to be pejorative, flyover states. Um, you know, there was more, you know, more I talk never about really, that. I think you that's know? a conservative yeah. talking point to say that people say flyover states. People really don't talk like that, I think. But yeah. anyway. But the, what about this idea of, of in your news organization, uh, to get to that question, what do you feel the need to go in and tell people 
you know, remind them of the mission and remind them of Oh, gosh, I, I wear it out. I mean, I, I write about that a lot. I think that one reason that you don't see more, you, you said, what are we doing to uh, put out that, you know, these are authoritarian temptations and tendencies. I think the reason you don't see more of that is that there's a fear well, when you do that, you, you will hear, stop your whining. You know, it does, it does often come across to people, right or wrong, as we're being too self-referential. You think it's all about you and what, stop your whining. Well, it's not about us at all. It's about the public. I mean, we are only working for the public. And so I think the main thing we have to do is show them by by the excellence of our work, hopefully, and by what we do, what our agenda, what our true agenda is. You just hope that in the end, people will see that for what it is. But I do also think we have to make a much stronger case for journalism. And I have spent years telling people on the right and the left that you know when when they are dancing on our graves, it, it will be so much worse for democracy if we're weakened even further, because um, you know that's just a recipe for a golden age of corruption. Well said. Sure. Thanks so much. I'm Jeremy Cadden. I'm with the Human Rights Campaign, but really I'm here tonight just as a private citizen. And uh, despite my youthful good looks, I, uh, I am old enough to remember the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite. Mm. And I, I'm just curious to hear the panel's thoughts about how we got from you know, those sort of, th that golden age where people just sort of turned on the news and trusted what they saw to where we are today? Uh, because there were three networks back then. Uh, there were a handful of newspapers <laughs> that came out every afternoon and gave you a daily digest of news. And now all you do is you pick up this and you get news, not by the day, not by the hour, not by the minute, but by the second. And you've got... From hundreds of... You've got exponentially greater number of journalists or citizen journalists out there now who are disseminating this information. Sure. And a lot of times you don't know what to believe, you don't know what's accurate. Uh, we've got again the, the fractionalization of America in terms of political ideology, the retrenchment of, of ideological positions on both sides. And we're just a much different country and we have much different communications and, and, and media than we had 30 years ago. I used to love when I was living in Canada, I was living in Toronto, I used to love watching Walter Cronkite every night. That's why I got into this business. I watched him do the, the space program, the moon shots, loved it and said, one day I want to do that. And for a short period of time, I actually got the opportunity to sit in the same chair as Walter Cronkite had sat in when I was filling in on the, on the evening news. But we're a much different world in terms of media, telecommunications and technology than we were back then. And it's just a natural evolution. And I also think that all institutions were more trusted then. And now we have, unfortunately, I, questioning is good, but disregarding is not good. And I think that we have moved towards away from skepticism to just completely distrusting all of our institutions. I think when Walter Cronkite used to end his show when he said that's the way it was, that's the way it was because we did not know his politics. And now, we know, you don't know my politics, you'd be surprised. But if, if we took the politics out of it and just talked fact, it would be a different moment. I don't know if people would be listening or watching. Because I believe that the line has been obscured, and I think it started around during the Clinton years, when fact versus opinion was, it was kind of like conflict, it was like, what is, is this a fat person or is this a infotainment? That yeah, yeah, yeah. It started changing around that time, and now you you almost know everyone's politics, be it reporters, be it opinion people on the air. It has gone into a whole nother realm, and I miss that. I was a kid who grew up watching Walter Cronkite. My dad would sit on the sofa, and I said, "Daddy, why are you always watching Walter Cronkite?" And as a child, he said to me. He said, April, he said, I want to know when the world is coming to an end. And, <laughs> wow. and I should have run like a crazy person, <laughs> but instead I ran to it like you. I ran to it. Walter Cronkite had a big influence on me. 
And, and, and that's what, and I always use him as the example. You did not know his politics, and I'd rather not know someone's politics and, and hear it straight versus all this other stuff that's out there. But let, me, let me just challenge you all, though. <clears throat> the, news was, the news business was different, and we touched on a little bit about infotainment. I mean, you had Sunday morning talk. You may have had PBS with Buckley, and, but you didn't have this moment when with all due respect, some of you appear on a show where there's more opinion than news. Your, your network approves or you do it. But also, you go back and do straight reporting. You watch, particularly on cable, where it goes from reporting to opinion. You know, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I long for the days of the National Campfire, three nets, major newspapers, and they wrote about stuff. Now, it wasn't exciting. I love what gas was 49 cents a gallon, too. Yeah. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But I think, well, I th you but, know, but uh, people are still buying that, gas. That, They're not that, buying news. That, that, what idea, do we do? that yeah. idea of okay. media in is America gone. is gone. We cannot pine away for the past. We have question, to accept so what, this is where we are now, so, and this is what we have to deal with. John, yeah. how, do you, how do you get that faith back in that environment if it's not going to go back to the old days? I think what you do is you just try to you, you do your job to the best of your ability and, and you try every day to tell the story accurately. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in, in regardless of whose side it comes down on, right. you tell the story accurately and you disseminate that information to your viewers. Right. And, and if, you're, if you've got a good story, sure other people are going to pick it up and it's going it's to snowball good. from there. All right. I, yeah, I was just going to say, listen, we are all walking around these days in our own information bubbles. Uh, and I think one of the ways oh. that I think in which, oh, what happened? We have an award, oh. have an award winner. <laughs> okay, wait, 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 okay, wait, wait, listen, okay. I think we may Breaking have a presidential news. Wait a minute, listen, Washington listen, tonight. listen, I'm gonna tweet it right now, okay, <laughs> forgive me. It says, for the real Donald J. Trump, despite some very corrupt and dishonest media coverage, there are many great reporters I respect and lots of good news for the American people to be proud of. Wow. Oh, there you go. Thank you. I think we should all wave. Those, I now, believe in that. That was just a word. <laughs> now, I, Feel I, free to do that, too. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I, hold on, I wait don't minute, know hold if that's the pre-show to the fake news. I was going to say, oh, yeah. Right. Okay. But wait, wait minute, there's hold on, more. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Wait. And the fake news yes, winners are. This is the are, red wait minute, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, all right. That was a, okay. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. This is 11 minutes ago. Hold on. Wait a minute. Let me see. Hold on. Let me see. I'm so thankful you guys have a good, oh my God. The link, the link, the link doesn't work, well good. The link doesn't work. Well, who's fake? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Jim, you go well, I was we'll, gonna, we'll go on for the moment. And feel free to break in, the anchors do it to me all the time. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Breaking news, breaking, breaking news, breaking news. We'll, we'll see if we can get it. Oh, yeah, it's, I, it's, I'm it's getting, the RNC website that it's linking oh, to. Okay. Getting deja vu. It's crashed. Um, no, I think we're all walking around in these information bubbles, and I think the, uh, one of the ways that Donald Trump was successful in that campaign was he, he was able, and I think the Democrats are going to have to good, get good at this, he was able to, to put together these penetrating messages that were able to break through people's information bubbles. And I would remember going to Trump rallies all the time and saying, my God, there's a lot of Democrats here. People wearing uh, construction boots and overalls and they look like they just came from the factory or, or so on. And he was able to uh, demonize immigrants in a way that made people think that, that, that their economic lot in life was the result of immigrants who had come into the country or that they should be worried about going to the airports because uh, you know, the president was, was trying to make this case that every Muslim was somebody that they should be afraid of and so on. And those penetrating messages were able to get through people's information bubbles in a way that I think did have an impact. And I, but to me, uh, there is no better way to penetrate people's information bubbles than with the truth. And wh what I ask people who are in their uh, conservative information bubbles, what I ask them to ask themselves is, was Barack Obama born from, in another country? Did, the, did Donald Trump have that one right or did he have that wrong? Are all Mexicans who come into this country, are they rapists and criminals? Did, did Donald Trump have that right or did he have that wrong? And I think over time, people are gonna, are gonna see that, that, that this information that they've been sort of immersing themselves in, in these information bubbles, it, it, it is not reliable. And I do think that there is a chance that we could come back, maybe not to the old days of Walter Cronkite, but to a day where the press is trusted more. I, I have faith, I'm optimistic that that day can still come. And we here's, have it, to believe that. Yeah. We can't do this and not believe that. Right. But, but here's, here's, here's one thing we need to do. 
Uh, I mean, again, back in the days of Walter Cronkite, it was a daily news digest. You got your newspaper in the afternoon. I know, because I used to come home from school, go on my paper route, and deliver the newspaper in the afternoon. Then the newspaper came in the morning, and then cable television came along, and then Twitter and everything else. What we need to do as news organizations, because there was such a drive for ratings, let's not kid ourselves. Right. It's about ratings, right? You can't have a news organization unless you have revenue. You can have some news organizations, but you can't have our news organizations without revenue, and you've got to have ratings to get the advertising dollars. This whole thing, particularly with Donald Trump, has created a hunger and a drive to be the person out there every day with the most spectacular story On either about side. Donald Trump. No, it's right. about Donald Trump. Right. It's that they have the most spectacular story about Donald Trump that is going to make people go, oh my God, I didn't know that. And it's, what's happened is because people have had that, that drive, that hunger to do that, some organizations, very big organizations, have gotten it wrong. Badly, badly wrong. And that has fed in to the narrative, to the to narrative extent, that you can't then, trust the press. Yeah. So we need to but, be sure we have it right. Right. But to some extent, More than ever. I, but but More to than some ever. extent, journalists are going to make mistakes. And I made this this well, point to Sarah Sanders in the briefing one day: is that honest journalists make honest mistakes. And that that you know we don't we don't put the free press on trial because this reporter got this story wrong or whatever. Because mistakes have been happening in the press well, since. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, Woodward and Bernstein have admitted they got a, you know, there were a couple of stories that were incorrect during the Watergate investigation. And, and, but and, we and, correct them. But we, and, and, and that's, that is a very yeah. good point, Melinda. That's right. And good, good news organizations issue corrections. They take action. If, if the infraction is serious enough, they take action. Uh, but we had a we had a couple of week period there where one big news organization were, after another one yeah. got a story badly wrong, and right. that does but where, nothing. I, yeah, but that where does are, nothing to help uh, yeah. our trust yeah. in what no, we. I do. agree, but where, I, my collectively. My question is though is where are the question where are the corrections and the clarifications over at the White House? We never seem to get oh. them. We never seem to get them, yeah, and that is why we're here, John. But that's, that's why but we're that's here. That's not unique to this White no, House. No. You know that. I, I do know that, but at the same did Barack time, Obama say I'm wrong. When George Bush was asked a question at a press conference, what's the biggest mistake you ever made? He said, I don't think I've made one. But I think that no, no I, administration I think that stuff, wants to say, go, oh, sorry, we got it wrong, stupid But us. you have to say this administration is more fact-challenged than any in yeah. my adult lifetime. I didn't say that. <laughs> I just said, what administration have you heard said, I got something wrong? Well, we'll go to a question doesn't over happen. here. Yeah. We'll go to a question there. Hello, Bruce Guthrie. Uh, I've never had kids, but when I watch the movies, it seems that when a fourth grader acts up, it's because they want attention. Um, and when you want them to behave like, at least up to a fourth grade level, you basically ignore them and put them in their corner. Question. It seems to me, is there any Question. chance that the news media, if the, if the conference gets so outrageous, if he just spouts so many lies, can you just walk out? And indicate we don't. Okay, cover so the question is, do you can just, you just not cover, cover truth? Can, can you can you not cover the president of the United States? No, no. You can't, I would not say that. No. Yeah. And that's that's something. That's, people, can't just walk out. Yeah, yeah. People always say, just walk out. Why do you take that? Why just leave? They like people say those things all the time. And the reason why we don't walk out is because if we walk out, you don't find out any information, and it creates more of a problem. It creates more of a terse atmosphere. It creates a whole conundrum, particularly with this administration. If we walked out, we may not have our seats back. Look, our, 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 our way of protesting is to just tell the truth. That if somebody tells a lie, we say that was a lie, and here's the truth. You walk out now. Of course, I famously walked out of a briefing yes. once, but it's because I had a live shot that I had to get to. I, I, um, and I, and I, that's what people you said this to me too that's, about, that's, about that's, the that's our, that's our ammunition, yeah. though. Yeah, I, Instead had, of walking out, when it's over, you walk out and you say, "This is what was said." Here's what the truth is. I, I've heard this, this uh, comment a, a number of times that you should just get up and walk out. Uh, you know, I've told people, uh, you know, Jim, how can you, uh, you know, people will say, Jim, how can you take those uh, responses from Sarah Sanders? She doesn't answer your questions and so on. I, I, what I tell people is that sometimes the non-answers <laughs> are more revealing than the answers. Okay. And I, th I want that. That's why I was, uh, you know, furious with Sean Spicer when he turned off the cameras in the briefing room. I want that. I want people to see everybody that. to be able to see that. Absolutely. Right. We have two people left. Uh, if you can direct a question to, uh, forgive me, I can only see two, three, um, three 
uh, but I think we don't, we're going to only have time for two. If, if you can ask a question specifically to... We, 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 it's actually right, we'll four. Three. It's yeah. actually four. And that's going to be five. All right. Um, my very, sp my very you can make the question, question to somebody individually short, let's do it, okay? Um, part of the attack that we're having on journalism isn't just uh, the president making statements or demonizing news, but there is a deliberate disinformation campaigns that are happening. What do we do to protect truth without damaging the First Amendment? Can we get Where is that balance, and are there organizations externally or governmentally that need to step up and do that work? Well, well we've never had a government-regulated press, so that's probably not a good rabbit hole to go down. Um, well, I, you're sitting in the house of one of them that tries to work on that. Uh, CPJ, you're looking at reporters that are up. And there are a number of organizations that, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, an education campaign, if I can uh, take that on. We have an education unit right now that reaches 10 million <laughs> students with how to look at the news, how to deal with this issue of junk news. We don't call it fake news. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there trying to deal with this issue of how do we deal with the administration and that we have, the administrations we've had in the past, uh, and, and you know, long-term bias, uh, qu questions about press bias. I don't know so much about, it. this isn't really dealing with this administration, but I think try, in trying to, to reinforce the truth, I think it's very important to be respectful of people of different <laughs> views. And, and one thing that bothers me a lot in the national conversation, if you can even call it that, in this very polarized time is how personal everything is. So instead of just saying, here's the fact, here's what I stand by, here's how we know this, it, 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 all this anger and all this personal demonization. So I think that the more we can be dispassionate, even about something we're very passionate about is, is I think, helpful. I, I did think. just get an update that said that Twitter released, uh, if you got trolled by fake news, by Russian attacks during the campaign, they're going to let you know. Like, this is, this is not just opinions that are coming out, but yeah. these are Facebook is dealing with this, Twitter is dealing with this. Uh, there are message boards all over the Internet where people are being targeted and rhetoric is driving this vitriol, the fomenting. Right, and, that, and that's part of the information explosion. The, yeah. You know, the more outlets you get, the more access people have and bad players from outside. Uh, I mean, I would tell you, uh, find your favorite news organization up here and just watch that and nothing else. But, but, there you go. I mean, we, we all, we all uh, you know, suffer from that because we sometimes have reported something off of Twitter that was wrong and we've had to go back and take it back. So again, it's, it, it, for us as news organizations, I think it's incumbent upon us to slow down mm -hmm. a little bit okay. and make sure you've got it right before you go out there. And I, help, and, and I think that by doing that, we can help to stave off some of this disinformation campaign that some other bad actors around in, in this country or around the globe would certainly like us to pick so up on it. So I don't have to borrow April's Secret Service protection. We'll try to get to each of you at the mic right now, but quickly. My name is Kurt Bell. Uh, 75 years ago and more, I was born and raised in this area. And when Trump was elected uh, in, in that November morning, I woke up and I thought, huh? Yeah, me and too. I've asked the question, <laughs> I've question. asked the question, who voted? for this man, and I got the answer, and I'm curious to see your reaction to the answer I got many times, uneducated white people. No. 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 I'm curious. Not the true. demos uh, that everybody has uh, seen, no, that's, think, that's, refute that. That's yeah. absolutely wrong. Um, and I can say that because I was on the Trump campaign for the entirety of the campaign, and I went to all of these little towns and all these flyover states because if you are a conservative, you do believe that you live in a flyover state. If you're anywhere other than California or New York or you know, other countries up and down the coast. And they're not uneducated white people. I mean, there are a lot of very well-educated people. There are a lot of people who are what are called the, the, what are termed the heart and soul of this country, who believe okay. in President Trump because they believe that he is the one that is going to make their lives better four years from now. So that's, it's a, it's, okay, it's a total, total, it's total one more. incorrect idea to believe that that's, that's who voted for him. From talking to people where I live now, uh, who uh, many of whom are still very passionate supporters of the president, 
they're like anyone else. They're, you know, from well-educated to, to not. And they, I feel that it's not even that they are so sure he's going to make their lives better. I think they like the way listening to him makes them feel. <laughs> I think that a lot of the campaign, and I covered some of the campaign as well, I remember, I mean, people loved the entertainment value of it, and they loved the spectacle and how he made them feel. I remember one man in particular, himself an immigrant who had come in illegally maybe 15 years ago, I think is what he said. And so I interviewed him before and he said, you know, I just love listening to this guy talk. And so he, ta he gave his spiel, you know, it was all about uh, building the wall and, you know, the usual thing about press hating and, you know, I'm amazed that no incident of violence happened against the press during the campaign. So after this rally, I went up to the same man, I saw him again, and I said, so what do you think now? He spent the whole time talking about you, you know, as an immigrant. And he said, uh, he was laughing, and he said, I can't talk too long, I got a wall to build and pay for. Okay. So, so, you know, there, you there, there were okay. some surprising Trump supporters. Third question, quick, and here the last one. We're gonna um, go there first. My name is Stephen Thomas, and I'm a citizen. It's just been one year. <laughs> one year. <clears throat> well, here's not my even question. Here yet. Here's we, my we question. We like to think of the White House as being measured in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> However, you every measure day, seven days yeah. long. It'll how, be a sir, year, your January twentieth at twelve oh one. And however, it's quick, measured. It's a relatively question, short period of time. My point is, something has been unleashed, and I'd like to hear you start reporting on what has been unleashed, what has been unleashed that set the stage for this, and then what do you want me to do? What do you want the rest of us as individual citizens to do? Because a lot of people in my neighborhood are just turning the news off. I, I, I will say that uh, as members of the press, we are not part of the resistance. We are not exactly. here to resist uh, from a political standpoint, what this president is doing. We are here to resist if our rights as journalists are attacked. And I think that that is our responsibility. But I, I, I think people have to start thinking deeply about what's happening to this country. I think what we saw last week, what the president said in private and became very public, is something that we have to spend a lot of time thinking about. And they can deny it and they can run away from us and try to kick us out of the White House. But when you have the President of the United States referring to countries in Africa and Haiti as shitholes and saying that you want people to come in from Norway, it reminded me of when we were at Trump Tower in August and he said that there were very fine people on both sides, meaning that there were very fine people among the white supremacists and the Nazis. And my question to people, and, and this also comes back to talking about banning people coming in from Muslim countries or targeting immigrants uh, in a way that is, in many ways, just racist. And people just have to start asking themselves, does that feel like America? And to me, that is just a question that I come back to as a journalist on a daily basis. And, you know, some people say, oh, Jim, you're, you know, you're, you're grandstanding, you're showboating. Uh, you know, I, I feel very passionate about this. My dad is a Cuban immigrant. Uh, my mom raised me by herself. Uh, I'm, I'm the child of a, a single mother. Um, John knows my family, um, and you know, uh, the country that I grew up with, we were talking about Walter Cronkite earlier, to me is changing in ways because of what we've been told over the last couple of years. And that is, it's okay for this group of Americans to be against this group of Americans over here. And it may sound like I have an agenda, or some of us have an agenda, or that we're, tr we're, we're coming at the president too hard, but at the, at the end of the day, there are just some deep, profound American principles at stake every day when we come into that White House. And I don't, I don't feel ashamed of all, at all of, of the job that I've been doing there. And, I, and I, I think it is our job to speak truth to power and to ask these hard questions every day because in many ways, this country is changing. And it's changing because of what's happening at the top. And I that's why that. what we're doing right now in my view, is so important. Very Just quickly. you asked what, what you can do. A couple things. One, I, I 
people I meet in the grocery store, I say, please subscribe to your local paper wherever it is you live. I mean, it's really important to actually support journalism, even if you can support it online, a couple bucks a month. I mean, that's so important. And I think the other thing that it's important to do is to talk to people with whom you disagree in a respectful way, because that's the only way that we're going to bring the country back together. And you know, a very interesting point in that is I, I think a large degree of where we are now is a reflection of how politics has been evolving. It used to be recently, as recently as you know, 20 years ago during the Clinton administration, that Democrats and Republicans could get along and they could actually do something that's good for the country. They don't do that anymore. And politics has become a zero sum game, not just where I win, but I win because you lose. And we need to get past that. I moved down here from Canada because I thought this was the greatest country in the world. And I'm really worried about where our politics is going. Yeah. It's the politics of polarization. It's a zero sum game. And somehow we need to change that. And I think part of what you could do is say, I'm not going to accept this idea that Republicans and Democrats can't work together. I can't accept the fact that I'm a Republican and all Democrats are nuts, or I'm a Democrat and all Republicans are bad. You know what? Mm -hmm. Jim says the word a lot. Crazy. <laughs> uh, so we need to be able to understand each other. We need to be able to have dialogue. What happened in the days where Republican members of Congress would be seen having a stake at Charlie right. Palmer's with you know, de Democratic members of Congress? You don't see that a lot anymore. April, and then we'll go here. Thank you. What I would like to see for everyone to look at news for what it is, news, and don't look for entertainment. Because when we crave this crazy behavior, it just feeds into that craziness that keeps it going. The stakes are so high. This is a very serious time. The goalposts have been moved. And we have got to stop looking to be entertained and look at the fact that everything comes to the White House from water peace and everything in between. Mm -hmm. It's not about, I'm amused by you. I'm intrigued by you. It's about one nation under God. We the people. It's not about the reality stuff. Okay. Hi, uh, Cristiano Lima with Politico. Uh, so some details have just come out about the fake news awards. Uh, I'm still catching up, but it seems like CNN. And you got some news to wait report because my wait links broke. Oh, okay. Here we go. Because this GOP site doesn't <laughs> open up. Yeah. Um, so okay. CNN won several categories. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you sure? Where well, did you get that from? Because this is broken. Uh, people have been able to access the site. Some people are tweeting out screenshots. I haven't been able well, to get on Well, it said error earlier. Who else? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, but okay. I just wanted to get a response from the White House see, correspondents. See, I'm real. Um, see, I want, I want right. the facts. Okay, we'll do. Okay. Internet Archive's got it. Okay. Okay. So, just wondering uh, if the recipients <laughs> had any response, and if you, <laughs> <laughs> on behalf the of the network, Jim, what would you like to? Yeah, say? that's right. Yeah. I, I would say, um, having been called fake news myself that the President of the United States is the king of fake news. Ooh. He is the king of fake news. He said Barack Obama was not born in this country. He said Mexicans are rapists and criminals. Um, he has said many things. He said he lost the election because undocumented people voted by the millions. He said uh, that he had the largest inauguration crowd of all time. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And and I, I don't want people to think that I'm saying that because, you know, I've got an ax to grind or I'm here to criticize or be political or have an agenda or whatever you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a fact. It, you, know, you know, we've been saying, you know, there's an apple and there's a banana. You know, um, we've been, we've been sticking that. to apples. <laughs> They're throwing out a lot of bananas. It's, it's uh, you know, and I, I think that um, it's unfortunate that the president has sunk to that level where he has to go around um, issuing these kinds of awards. It's, it's just not, it's just not like what you would think would happen in this country. I but didn't here see we your are. name on it. I didn't see your name on it. Is his name on it? No, no names, what? as far as I know. Just, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Jim. You didn't win an award? <laughs> uh, you mentioned, you said our news organization had been. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. well, CNN I'm defending my names. news organization. Our news organization. No. And it is not only a news organization in this country, it's a news organization that is spread throughout the world. 
John, you know that because you, you travel with us all over the world. We have reporters, we have journalists, we have photographers, we have producers on the front lines in some very bad areas, mm -hmm. in war zones, in, in, exactly. hot, in, in all, all kinds of political hot zones, risking their lives, reporting the facts, and doing the news. And it's an insult to every journalist around the world to be even handing out fake news awards. It shouldn't be happening. Not only forget about in undemocratic countries, it sure as hell should not be happening in the United States of America. And you know what this is going to do. This is going to change the dynamic. He's pointing fingers and pointing out things. I mean, he even went back to, to right when he was... Um, uh, when he became president, and, 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 and the reporter, we all know who it was, made a mistake and didn't see the King bust in there. And he called out Time Magazine. But what's, what this is going to do, it's now going to cause the atmosphere to change, and people are going to be watching him, and it's going to be more dogged against him to see if, it's, if he's telling the truth or what have you. This, this just, it's ugly. And it just goes to the to the the lowest levels of, of who we are as a society. Our founding fathers did not expect, I'm sure when they <laughs> pulled you know, the First Amendment and all the other amendments together, that there would be the Twitter, and there would be, <laughs> there would be a Jim Acosta, there would be a John Roberts and April Ryan. But that's one thing about this country that sets us apart from others. The freedom of the press, the freedom of information, the freedom to speak and ask questions of the leader of the free world. This is ugly. And, and, and I want to end on this. Um, if CNN is so fake, why is he watching CNN all the time to say, yeah. I don't like this one and I don't like that one? I just, this is just, it is what it is. Move on. And see, that's a, again, this is the reality piece instead of dealing with the serious. And I'm going to say this the stakes are so high. Why put this out now when they are trying to figure out how they're going to pay for the government before it shuts down at midnight Friday? We got a, a, a leader over North Korea whose button is not as big as ours. <laughs> Why are we doing this now? It's not a joke. Agreed. I want to thank the audience who is with us here in the museum, those of you watching online. Uh, for those of you who are here, let me uh, uh, mention that April will be signing copies of your book, I believe, The Presidency in Black and White, my yes. close-up view of mm -hmm. four presidents and race in America in four. the atrium after this. <laughs> uh, but again, thank you very much. I, I will have to close with this thought, if I may. Um, I also do a column. I stay, have my hand still in the journalism field. And, uh, my suggestion on what to do with these awards was take note of them. If we can learn anything as journalists from those awards, take it and then move on to the stories that matter. Amen. Uh, and so with that, thank you for being with us. And please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks a lot.